Good morning, meine Freunde, and willkommen to the lowdown on the countdown that got down in the downtown of my very funky little river city. And to what is very possibly the very weirdest top 10 ever. That being the top 10 for the week ending 10th of April 1964. Propping up the entire Improbable Enterprise is a pretty good record. Brian Poole and the Tremolos version of a song made famous by the great, great Roy Orbison, Candyman. Co-written by Fred, Everybody's Talking Neil, and originally released in 1961 as the B-side to perhaps Orbison's masterpiece, Crying, the song bounded up no fewer than 30 places to debut in the top 10. With and without Brian Poole, the Tremolos were one of the most successful English groups, with 21 top 40 hits, including 20 releases in a row, with 9 top 10s and 2 number 1s. Brian Poole and the Tremolos trivia time, when the Beatles were knocked back by Decca Records, and almost everything about that encounter was, by the way, total fiction. The group that Decca signed instead of the Beatles were Brian Poole and the Tremolos. Number 9 is one of the genuinely zero cares given MFs in non rock and roll history, Mr. Acker Bilk. He of the stripy waistcoat, the goatee, and the ever present bowler hat. He of the low, breathy clarinet that once heard stays in your memory as distinctively as Jimi Hendrix's guitar tone or Miles Davis's bottom register. His Stranger on the Shore from 1962 is one of pop culture's most ubiquitous artifacts. Any fan of Mitchell and Webb's radio shows will know it as the theme music, and was only the second British record to make number one in the US. But this week, the harem dominated the Aussie charts. Pretty much Stranger on the Shore's demented cousin, the harem swings with mad abandon, banjos, chorus and Mr. Bilk himself banging, crashing and juddering like a whirling, twirling dervish. No doubt sowing the seeds for Acomania, the next big thing. One of the genuine pleasures of this series is that in addition to the globe bestriding super acts one gets to note week by week, I do get to write about the local heroes who, while perhaps not registering a blip on the radar of the wider world of the music stage, helped build an overachieving Australian music industry. And one such hero is Judy Stone, whose 4,003,221 tears from now reached its peak of number eight this week after a 29 place rise from the previous week. Stone went on to a long career on the top 40 as one of the pillars of the golden age of Australian television, as a solid club act and as a tireless charity performer. She had bigger hits, but this week's top 10 denizen is still the one that'll send the putters home happy. This week, we bring the fabulous world of facts forward to the forefront because of the unique circumstances of this week's chart. Unbelievably, the entire top seven is booked out by a single act. Has this ever happened anywhere in the world? Except perhaps in some crazy communist dictatorship where the beloved leader fancies himself a bit of a crooner? So, the fastest riser this week was obviously Brian Poole and the Tremolos with their 30 place rocket ride up the charts and its inverse was California Sun by the Rivieras, down 12 spots to number 21. In the USA, the chart-topping single of the moment was Can't Buy Me Love by the Beatles, and who could blame them? And in the UK, unsurprisingly, the same song reigned supreme. These are pre-album chart days in, in my hometown, but I'm going to have a guess that the number one album in the hometown was with the Beatles, but as always, I could tolerate correction in this manner. So, to celebrate the band who block booked the entire top seven for this week, and this week alone, Dawn by the Four Seasons broke the streak the next week by climbing from 12 to 6, I'm going to quickly toss out 10 irrelevant items of Beatle trivia. Beyonce has won four times as many Grammy Awards as the Beatles. Forget the Hall of Fame, the real fraud is obviously the Grammys. The copyright on Love Me Do has lapsed in the EU and it's now considered public domain. The only George Harrison song they ever played live was If I Needed Someone. Ringo was the first Beatle to become a grandfather. I like the idea of Granddad Ringo. So bad was his eyesight that under English law John Lennon could have been declared legally blind. On their 1965 US tour, the Beatles played a 35 minute set for the equivalent of three quarters of a million dollars in today's money. 
On April 4th, 1964, the Beatles had the entire US Top 5 and seven other songs in the Top 100. Clearly their American fans didn't love them as much as we did. When asked why he thought a madman had stabbed him seven times in a 1999 attack, George Harrison replied, I don't think he was auditioning for the Travelling Wilburys. Harrison also had a lifelong love of shoplifting, having been taught the rudiments by John Lennon in Transit to Hamburg. Number 9, what I'm sure you all know, the Abbey Road cover shows the group walking away from the studio. Number 10, we go back to that famous story about Decca Records turning down the Beatles in 1962. Almost every word of the version we know is false and was probably invented by Bob Wooler or Derek Taylor or, or someone along those lines in the Beatles press office. Dick Rowe, the man who auditioned the group, George Martin, by the way, didn't audition the Beatles for EMI, Norman Smith did, and went and interrupted Martin's tea break to have him come and listen, went on to sign the Rolling Stones, Van Morrison with them, the Moody Blues, the Tremolos, the Zombies, John Miles Blues Breakers, the Tornadoes, Tom Jones, the Small Faces, Marmalade, Billy Fury, Tommy Steele, the Animals, Cat Stevens and Propal Harum amongst many others, so it wasn't like he was a mug, the guy knew what he was doing. The simple fact is that he was authorised to sign one band to an A contract and one to a B contract. The Beatles made a terrible audition, listen to the tape, you can't disagree, and Brian Poole and the Tremolos did better and frankly were cheaper. Rowe offered Epstein a B contract, which Epstein convinced the Beatles he could do better than, and his final contract with Parlophone was barely better than the B contract, so they passed. Rowe, to his dying day, vehemently denied ever saying that groups with the guitars were on their way out, which would make no sense for him to say anyway, because he signed a group with the guitars in Brian Poole and the Tremolos. And in a final delicious irony, Rowe's song Richard was the man who oversaw the deal that sold the Beatles publishing catalogue from under their noses to Michael Jackson in 1986. What is it that's said about a dish best served cold? So, let's look at the week. The Beatles went 7 for 7 and how exactly they went about it. Number 7 was held by the former 6 week number 1-er, I Wanna Hold Your Hand. Slowly sinking down the charts, it ended up spending six months besplendering. I may have just made that word up. Much has been said about this record in edition number six, but it warrants repeating. This is a magnificent record. It broke long established compositional rules for pop songs. For example, the verse in the home key is G major until the end of the opening 12 bars of the verse where it flicks for four bars into the harmonically iffy but tension building B minor. One of the greatest and most important ever made and few songs demonstrate the power and the primacy of the hit single as potential equal to the album as an artistic statement and evolutionary driver in popular music. At number six, the most popular triangular number in the entire top 10, with the possible exception of 10 itself, we have She Loves You, now seven and a half months into its chart run without ever having made number one. This and I Want to Hold Your Hand are the twin pillars on which the pop and later rock of the rest of the decade were built on. Driving, optimistic, empowering of their audience, but introducing a new code, a new cant, intrinsically understood by that new audience. Number five is the Twist and Shout EP, with the fantastic title track, A Taste of Honey, or as Lennon pithily called it, A Waste of Money, a George vocal with Do You Want to Know a Secret, and one of the most underrated of all Beatles songs, There's a Place, that has the first sparks of the magic Lennon imbued songs such as In My Life, Strawberry Feels Forever, or Julia with. Numbers three and four are a rather odd case. They're two sides of the same single, which despite having been on the charts for three months, having previously occupied number one and number two spots, and despite being subject to separate reporting where one store reported number four, Love Me Do, as the sale, and the shop in the next suburb reported number three, I saw her standing there, and despite I saw her standing there having spent six weeks at number one already, so all those buyers would have no need to buy Love Me Do, and yet they are still severally going strong on the charts. 
The Sharon Strouder of the charts this week was Roll Over Beethoven, with its B-side the slightly ghastly Hold Me Tight, itself charting at number 22, meaning George got an A-side vocal in this Liverpudlian landslide of Merseyside malarkey. Of the 66 officially released cover versions of the band recorded, nine of them are Chuck Berry songs, making him by some way the most represented artists. Some Roll Over Beethoven trivia. The first song the Beatles ever played in the US at the Washington Coliseum on February 11th, 1964, they opened with Roll Over Beethoven. And as inevitably as day follows night, and as love follows loss, what follows number two is number one, and this week, atop the mighty dog pile of beetle maniacal frenzy, there is but one. Take it away, Gene. All My Loving, another EP, this one much more spotty than its predecessing EP, featuring the genuinely great title track, Money, Ask Me Why, and the much maligned P.S. I Love You. The EP spent five weeks at number one, finally falling to a world without love by Peter and Gordon, a song fittingly written by John and Paul, well, by Paul, Peter of the band being his prospective brother-in-law, through Paul's dalliance with the carrot-topped cutie Jane Asher, Recorded in 13 takes, there are 14 listed on the session sheet, but it appears take 5 was never attempted. The song draws much rightful attention to George Harrison's confident, twangy guitar solo, but the real heroes here are Paul and Ringo, who are so tightly locked together around Paul's strutty walking bass that they are what even a crusty old jazzbo such as I would call in the pocket. And as Ian MacDonald points out in his seminal book on the music and cultural impact of the Beatles, revolution in the head. How their contemporaries must have winced to see them toss out songs as good as this as mere fillers for albums, knowing they had even greater things in the can for singles. And thus we end the top 40 in my hometown with all that remains is to be said that I hope you found this enjoyable and interesting. I would be enlightened and delighted by your comments, reflections or insights, which you may care to leave below, and I look forward to your company the next time we gather to either gape in awestruck or or mock in mocking guffaws at the past, that most foreign of countries.